Uh, this is Rowan, and this is uh, my latest uh, review of the from the Raythu uh, series, uh, and this is for uh, Tears of Sons uh, by Victoria Copus. Okay, so I guess there needs to be a cat in this review, and uh, so where to begin? So this. Um, introduces a new tribe, which would be the Chaos, which, um, thank you, uh, one of our lead characters, which would be uh, the namesake Tirza him himself is from, and uh, and it also features his Chesnari Zen, who is from the Galaming tribe, and that well, that runs down the uh, the two leads, and more importantly, this uh, this features their life in a refugee camp, um, featuring um, both uh, Harish, which would be Raythu, and human refugees um, from the Varish War between the Galming and the Vars, now known as Parciel, and uh, mainly it features a the lives of, uh, of Tirza and Zen, as well as their son, Ilan, and also the human boys that Tirza ends up fostering, uh, which would be um, Michael and David, would be, who are the or orphaned sons of their, uh, their housekeeper, Daria, who um, very early on in the book, um, dies during childbirth, and the baby was stillborn. Uh, when it begins, Michael is about, no, I think it's David, is about four or five years old. Michael is closer to ten, I believe. And by the end of the story, Michael is about fourteen, so David has also progressed in age. Not too long after um, Michael and David end up basically adopted by Tirza and Zen, uh, they discover that one of the other uh, human members of the community, which would be Gorin, who is eventually revealed to be some gang kingpin of sorts, that's not given much detail, as it's all told from Terza's point of view. It's discovered that, you know, while Gorin has been known to take in orphans, nobody else will. Uh, he's been abusing the children that have been under his care, uh, including Eris, who is, um, who is shown to have an accelerated uh, telepathic abu abilities compared to other humans, and also Zia, who was kept as a sex slave uh, by Gorin. While a lot of the, uh, while the back, while the back cover um, blurb, as well as a lot of promotional copy, uh, f says that this focuses on the day-to-day -day lives of ordinary Hara, uh, I think that underplays a lot of the story. Like many of the books in the uh, in the Raythu series, especially uh, Storm's uh, contributions to it, uh, telepathy plays a huge role driving the plot to the point that a lot of it feels almost a Deus Ex Machina. But um, but it's in a very organic way that is not at all awkward. More so, I think that kind of I think. Um, the writing that uh, that says it's, it's an odd glimpse of the day-to-day -day lives of ordinary Hara. I, I don't know. I think that downplays uh, the fact that this is, takes place in a refugee camp. They are not exactly ordinary uh, when you consider that. Uh, plus, Zen has some kind of um, lower but still ranked position in the Gelming uh, military, uh, and plus, uh, Tirza does have some sort of high-regarded rank within his own tribe. Again, they're not exactly ordinary. When I think ordinary, I think 
people who have no political or yeah you know, have, have no political rank within their own tribes which I guess Zen doesn't exactly have a political rank but he does have a considerable high cat move or lay down we're gonna lay down okay um, I, I guess that depends on how you'd consider military rank to um, within the grander scope of political rank, I suppose. One thing that really stands out to me as just, I, I'm, it just, a, that just struck me as this, what the hell are you doing sort of thing with the, with the, um, with the writer, is from the beginning, it's apparent that Terza and Zen have not been married very long. And, um, so through the previous novels uh, within the uh, with it, within the um, world of Raythu, it's it's um, it's implied in uh, in some of Storm's books and is outright um, said so in Breeding Discontent, which would be the first um, published novel um, through Emanuel Press that had not you know been by Storm and. That uh, so in breeding discontent, it's outright said that um, gestation of uh, of pearls, which later um, which later lat hatch into harlings. Um, so the gestation period within um, within a hostling har's body is about two months, you know, give or take a week or so, you know, much like a human pregnancy, and then about more two more weeks for the uh, for for the pearl to hatch. So, um, their, uh, their, their, their harling is hatched a little under a week at the beginning of the book. And it's implied that Terza and Zen had not been Chesna or basically Raythu marriage equivalent. It, it's implied that they had not been, uh, formally Chesna bonded for very long. And as we go further into the book, it's revealed that... They're together because uh, Tirza was involved in some kind of apprenticeship um, w that was made as a political alliance between um, between the Gelming and Chaos. Again, this th the whole thing about them being ordinary horror just really feels like it downplays the. Uh, the, uh, the, the socio-political alliances, specifically of Terza uh, himself. So Terza was um, was sent to the Tigran Palace um, in the Gelming um, uh, city of Emanion. Uh, some sort of apprentice thing um, worked out between his own um, father and Hosling, as well as um, whatever, Gelming, higher rank, whatever, and so, uh, and so basically, Zen saw Tirza, liked him, the feeling was mutual, and then very hastily, it's implied, it was a little under a couple months, maybe, they were blood-bonded by... Uh, by Pelaz, who would be the, uh, the, the Tigran of, uh, the Gelming and Emanion. And see, that's just one of those things that I'm just like, what the hell are you doing here? Because, um, simply because of the fact that Pelaz himself was hastily ushered into a blood bonding for purely political, um, motives in, uh, in the Chronicles um, trilogy, and so, and, and this, in the, in the case of these two, it has no political motives, it has, it, while the concept of soulmates is definitely canonical within the world of Raythu, again, this just feels like, it, it, it just feels like they, they were, they were pretty much married because they were both just like, okay, they're mutually attracted, so let's blood bond, and I kept thinking, like, every time it would come up that these two had not known each other for very long, and yet their blood-bonded Chesna 
I'm just like, what the hell are you doing? Just like, this makes no sense within the context of all previous uh, novels, especially. And it, it's, it's made clear even in the Chronicles trilogy, which would be the, the first tri Raythu trilogy, uh, the first three Raythu books at all. Uh, it, it, it's heavily implied in that trilogy, and it's kind of outright stated in the, uh, in the history uh, novels, also by Constantine, that most Chesna bonds are not necessarily given blood bond. In fact, most don't even see need to do so. So the fact that Terz and Zen are outright blood bonded after knowing each other maybe six weeks. I don't know, it just it just seems so weird that this would be outright stated. I, it just doesn't feel right. I don't know, I'm just, I just find myself asking the author, you know, just like through the power of my mind, I suppose. I'm just, I'm just find myself asking, what the hell is going on here? Like, why is this even a thing in the story? And I, I, I and, and it has no answers. It has no answers. It's just supposed to be taken as a given that they're soulmates. Okay, that's fine. Um, but again, there are there are details to this that just make me wonder why is it do why are you doing it this way? Because again, there most most Chesna relationships see no need for blood bonding. Blood bonding is. Um, is, is considered something that is a bit over the top. Now, uh, in Western human society, at, in the here and now, many people do want that legal paperwork to their marriage to validate it. But, um, but, um, but Raythu societies generally consider themselves above that need, that it's not necessary that we make it legal, you know, where, you know, it's not necessary that we go through the, um, the, the ornate ritual of blood bonding. We're just Chesna. That's just how it is. And, and so, again, that, like, that is just something that I just find so weird. It's just so weird in context of the other stories that have come before it where I just kind of find myself wondering, what the hell are you doing? Like, why do you even need to do this? Canonically, it is completely unnecessary. And, you know, compared to other books that came before it. And even within the context of this novel itself, it just stands out as just so odd. You know, it's just so odd. Like, like what, what is it, even is the purpose of describing their relationship as explicitly blood bonded when again like first off it's already been established in the in the five full length novels before this it's established that blood bonding is not necessary for uh, for chesna partners fair enough so then what what even is the purpose of this and especially since palaz is stated to be the one who blood bonded Terz and zen like why would he do that? Like by the end of um, by the end of the third Chronicles novel, uh, Fulfillment of Fate and Desire, it's it's at the very least implied all over the place that blood bonding so hastily, especially in the way Palazid had been to you know, which was purely for political motives, and but the fact that it was just so hastily done that this has left a sour taste in his mouth. So you're kind of wondering, like, why would he do that with two ha Hara who barely know each other? Why? What is... I don't know. It's just such a weird thing that stands out to the point where it's kind of distracting from an otherwise really good book. The thing that I loved about this book um, the most that is the reason that I would give it, like, you know, on, on your average five-star scale, I would give it four rather than three. And, like I said, that, that, that thing with the blood bonding and the fact that they're 
they're Chesma while they barely know each other, yet they're having a harling, and that's how the book begins. I don't know. It's just, it's just such a weird thing. It's just such a weird thing that even um, canonically in the Wraith universe, it just, it just stands out. It's just like so weird. Why is this one weird thing? But I elevated up to four because, um, you know, out of your typical five star scale, I elevated to four because the story is an otherwise really good character study of Terza. And the book begins where he's just a goddamn brat. He is just a brat and he is I I wouldn't necessarily say he's spoiled, but he just comes off as as such a brat early on in the book that I, I, I seriously want to punch him in the mouth. Like, I just want to punch him in the mouth. He's pretentious. He's so pretentious in the first few chapters. And then you see, like, it's kind of a curiosity. That's why he's kind of working on his, uh, on his relationship with Daria. Uh, it, it's just like this curiosity. Like, he, he'd grown up in a society of, um, of Rethu where he didn't really interact with humans in his in his tribe where he came from. And so he finds the concept, just the concept of women existing as a separate sex from men. He just finds he just finds her so fascinating and curious and it's after he works on his friendship with her only to soon after, you know, like soon after he realizes that Derry is probably the best friend he'd ever had. Soon after he realizes that she dies in childbirth, and um, and so it's out of a sense of loyalty that he takes on that he takes in her her sons as his own, and through that we see him grow and mature from this pretentious brat into a fully matured adult, and that is what's fascinating about this uh, story to me. That's why. That, that's why I give it. That's why I would give it a four over a three. The character study of Terza and I'm sucked in, and I'm brought in, and it's just it's just wonderful to me. Would I recommend this um, to somebody who has not read the other uh, Raythu stories before it? Probably not. This would probably not make a lick of sense to anybody who hasn't read at least um, at least Storm's um, first two trilogies. So the first six books, I would really recommend reading those. Otherwise, there's a lot of this that probably would not make any kind of sense whatsoever. Uh, you would sit there wondering, okay, what the hell is going on? And that is fair. That is fair. Not every, not every book in a series needs to stand alone. But as far as um, as far as what I recommend it to fans of Storm's um, books, like uh, the Chronicles trilogy and the Histories trilogy, would I recommend this then? Absolutely, absolutely. Like uh, you don't have to read it in publication order, like I am. Uh, so you don't really need reading discontent to make any sense of what's going on here. That's fine. Obviously, I can't stop you from reading it on its own if you really want to try that. Go ahead. Um, compared to Breeding Discontent, would I necessarily say this one is better or worse? I would say it's about an equal. Um, so, hi. Oh my gosh. It's the Fluffy Butt Show. So, but this one... Um, this one, aside from the fact that, um, that, that Victoria Copus just is going in this weird angle with their relationship, like I said, I, I don't, the, the fact that they are, uh, canonically blood-bonded, um, Chesna, that just makes no sense within the context of the other books. That, to me, that makes just, it just makes no sense to me within the context of the other books. It just doesn't. It, it, there's no way it needs to make it. There, there's no reason it needs to be that way, and it's not given any reason within the text other than 
they just happen to be soulmates, and Palaz picked up on this, and therefore, like, did not object to doing a blood bond ritual for them. I don't know. I don't know. I, it just... I don't know. It just made no sense to me in the context of every other book I'd read before this one. It just really did not. Um, but yeah, like I said, that, that, that part is distracting. But the, uh, but everything else, you know, the, the character study of Terza is, is wonderful. I went from hating this character at the beginning. Like, I, I, I found myself, like, in the first three chapters, like, thinking, oh god, am I even going to be able to finish this? Because this character is just so pretentious. But, um, but yeah, he went from this, this pretentious little twat waffle who needed to be punched in the mouth to a real adult. <laughs> he fully matured by, um, he fully matured by the end of this book. And, of course, that makes sense because it's implied, um, uh, discounting the epilogue, yeah, not counting the epilogue, it's implied a good, um, uh, a good five years, uh, pass within the, uh, within the story, and then, like, by the epilogue, like, ten years had passed since the beginning, since, uh, since, yeah, it said, uh, uh, David was accepted on his 13th birthday, so that would be, yeah, David was about two or three at the beginning of this one, and that would be Derry's youngest. So, yeah, like I said, not counting the epilogue, about five, maybe six years of time passes over the course of the story, and so, yeah, it's, and it all feels very organic, the way that Turza um, grows and matures as an adult, and is, I don't know, I kind of wish that she had gone a little bit more in-depth with his relationship with Zen, maybe explained a little bit more about, like, just, I don't know, just like, why did she feel the need for a blood bonding? I, I don't understand that, because like I said, up until every book I'd read before this, which would have been, yeah, yeah, five books. Um, so the the first trilogy in Omnibus, then the Histories trilogy, and then Breeding Discontent um, by um, Wendy Darling and Brigitte uh, Parker. So yeah, like the five books I'd read before this, it's just... It's just kind of taken as a given that some relationships just turn out to be Chesna, and that's just how it is. And there's no real need for blood bonding unless, you know, either A, in the case of Palaz and Kairu, um, it's, uh, it, it's for political purposes, or if you are just a sucker for the ritual. And again, it's not really given an explanation why... Um, why Terza and Zen are blood bonded Chesna in this one, other than uh, soulmates? I don't know. It just it just feels kind of it doesn't drive the plot. So I don't want to say it's MacGuffiny. It's just it, it just one of those things that it it distracted me enough at parts where obviously I had to rant on about it for about half the review because it is it's it's a little distracting at times. Um, at least it was for me. But, like I said, I elevated it from a good solid three to a soft four, uh, just because it was very distracting. But again, it's a solid, it's a solid piece. It's a solid piece of work. Uh, the story is, and like I said, the, the, real, the real selling point for me uh, to you, uh, potential reader of this, uh, has to be the character study of Teresa. I loved it. When when an author can take a character that I begin wanting to punch in the mouth, I, I genuinely wanted to punch Terza in the mouth. I wanted to give him material form in our world so I could punch him in the mouth <laughs> in the first two chapters of this book. Like, that is, that is how he is. And then he kind of softens on you. He kind of grows on you a little bit. And you start to see little hints here and there come out um, initially that's like that kind of softened me on him it's hard to really point down when because I finished this book in February and I'm so late with the review but that's okay and selling point to me would be 
the character study of Terzin. It's fabulous. I, I went from hating this character, wanting to punch him in the mouth, to just really falling for him as a character. He has, he has a really deep, passionate soul, and that, that made itself so much more evident um, later on in the book. And you see how that kind of um, fueled his pretentiousness early on. Uh, but yeah, you do, you do see him, um, coming to, you, you do see him coming around and fully maturing, and that, like I said, for me, that is the selling point. Uh, when, when an author can, can take a character that I want to punch in the mouth, that I hated this character at the beginning, and toward the end, I just, I just fell in love with him. I wanted to give him a hug, like, his life, his life, especially with these kids, like his own harling with Zen and the children he took on from his best friend ever in the world, uh, really, honestly. <laughs> um, you see him taking on, you, you see him taking on uh, Daria's orphaned boys, and you see him taking in um, teenagers from the, uh, fr from the gang lord who, I don't know, they... I almost feel like Goran's little bit is just such a footnote of a plot um, that there was no real need, I don't know, they, she did something a little bit forgettable <laughs> with, uh, with, with Goran coming back later in the, in the book. Um, but yeah, Goran's kind of forgettable as far as, um, especially for some kind of gang lord type character who, you know, in the human society that needs the refugee camp. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, and, and you see him taking in these abused teenagers who have been through hell, and he just has so much empathy and, and passion behind it. He... He, he's he's a nurturer, very very much so, and and like I said, I I started out hating this character, and I came around to love him, and that that's a good author. That's a good author who can really get into the head of their character, and I just there are just a couple things that I kind of wish were done a little bit differently, and one of them was very distracting. The other one was kind of forgettable, um, but, you know, whatever, there's, there's forgettable elements to every book <laughs> that you read. Um, so yeah, other than the fact that I really would have wished she'd done the thing with, um, you know, the, the, ex the, the details of their Chesner relationship, I don't think it needed to be blood bonded, I really don't, because, like I said, every, every Raythu novel before this one, just, it was, it, it seemed apparent that this was a thing that very few Hara ever really saw the need to with their Chesna relationships. It's just kind of taken as a given that some relationships are just that deep, that you don't need to. It's just a given that you're Chesna and this is your Chesnari, and, and blood bonding would either be for political motives, as with uh, Palaz and Keru, as I said, or for, yeah, because you're a sucker for the ritual, for, for showing off, in a way. So, so yeah, like I said, I would definitely recommend it to fans of, um, of Storm's books, especially if you loved Breeding Discontent. I do like the, I do kind of like um, this take on it for, um, hi, for, uh, for more fan-created work. And I really do appreciate the fact that uh, Storm, with uh, the expanded Raythu mythos, has uh, given a voice to fanfic writers, basically. And um, so, yeah, there's there's that angle. If you want to give if you want to give support to what's basically elevated fanfic, and that's okay. Um, I would definitely definitely recommend checking this one out. 
it, it's a it's a really solid, you know, three and a half, three and three quarter, four stars. I don't know. It's because the character study. The character study is what really sells it to me, and apparently I might be late for dinner. Am I? For now, am I late for dinner? Is that why you smack me with your tail? Maybe. Kitty. Kitty, kitty. Hi. What book do you want people to read? You want them to read your butt. Well, it... If somebody's writing on your butt, Murnau, please tell me who, because that is that is abuse. I'm not writing on his butt. Let me see. What's your butt say? I don't know. It's too dark from this angle. I can't tell if anybody's written on your butt or not right now. Hi. Teddy. Okay, so I guess that wraps it up. And, as I tend to do, bats and kisses and... I very much appreciate you, and Murnau definitely does all this time you've got here looking at the sweet kitty. The sweet kitty. The sweet kitty of sweetness. Yes, she is. Okay. So, again, bats and kisses, and take care of yourselves. And slan! Right? Murnau, tell them. Okay. Hi. You're in the way again. What are we doing? Please move. Please move. Or at least lay down. Move or lay down. Please. Please. Oh, where to begin with this? So, a uh, brief rundown. This is, uh, this is, um, hi! Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Honey. Oh my gosh. Hi. Can we move? For now? Seriously. You are so much in the way right now. Oh my gosh. May I take my notes? Is this going to be a cat review? Murnau. Hi.